We're going to take the next um, couple of hours to... Um, no, seriously, thank you for staying. Um, we're the last presenters. Nanofabrica is the earliest stage company that presented in this conference. We, that's why uh, we left them for, uh, for last. Um, I represent I3 Equity Partners. We're a, a next generation VC investing in very early stage startups um, with one unique twist, which is we connect our portfolio companies with our investors in a very direct uh, way. Our investors include Microsoft, Qualcomm, GE, Tata, HNA, uh, the local fund, Pitango, and a few others. And each company has their uh, connection with one or two of our investors to facilitate their growth and take them to the next level. Um, in order to start, John, why don't you say a few words about yourself and about Nanofabrica? Great. Hi. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I'm John, CEO and co-founder of Nanofabrica. And what we do at Nanofabrica is ultra-high resolution 3D printing. And what this does is bring 3D printing into new markets where ultra-high resolution is needed, like semiconductors, optics, electronics. You know, markets that till now don't have uh, digital uh, on-demand manufacturing capabilities. Um, so imagine you want like a micro stent to go into the brain. You want it to be fast on time. You want it to be customized. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that we're able to do now with this technology. Mm, the, the technology itself and the product has been developed from the beginning with direct interaction with customers. So it's really market-driven technology. Do you want to show some of the slides? Yeah, sure. So here we have some parts that we've printed on our, uh, on our uh, printer, which is, of course, proprietary and patented. Um, I'll stand up just to see it. So what you can see here is um, a micro uh, lens holder. It's for a big German company that does uh, sensors. And, and it's very important for them, the precision, and because they manufacture in small batches, batches of around 100. Many batches, but of around 100. So digital manufacturing is perfect for them. What you can see here is, is a part for uh, a company that does micro batteries. And the width of, of that wall over there is 20 microns. 20 microns is about two blood cells. And that's something that you simply cannot do with any other technology that, that exists today. Um, the last part that I'll show is from uh, optical communication industry. So that's uh, on the right-hand side, you can see the, the hole of a needle. And next to it, you can see the part that we manufactured for them where they, that positions their optical fibers in, inside the, the part. Cool. So um, you haven't said anything about yourself and your background. Maybe you want to say a few words about that and explain why you decided to start a company around the most difficult area to get funded, which is hardware, factory machinery, Combined in one startup. <laughs> yeah, hardware. hardware does have the name hard in it. You know, I could have like foreseen it. Um, so, so the the benefit of doing, I think, uh, get it, of looking for funding at least in an area of hardware, is that it, it is hard, but there are less people doing it. You know, when you come to the VCs, at least in Israel, it's not like it's the tenth hardware uh, startup that they've seen today. So that's a kind of an advantage. Um, another reason is that I think we didn't realize uh, how hard it was going to be at the beginning to get funding for a hardware startup in Israel. Um, and the third reason is that it's really we come from the industry. I, um, my partner was head of uh, ink development and materials at HP Indigo. I have a PhD in nano optics. And we're just naturally drawn to, to do something physical, hardware. And because you like impossible challenges, um, John didn't tell you, but he's a special ops Israeli army with uh, a lot of things they cannot tell you. And if I continue <laughs> talking about him this way, he's going to have to kill me at some point. Uh, so I'll continue and move on to the next question. Um, so other than the generic fact that you are making machines and hardware, what was the number one challenge when you went out looking for money for your huge idea to transform industries and change the way people manufacture small things. What was the number one main challenge that you faced? Um, yeah, so the, the challenge was that um, the market 
it's very hard to put like a number behind it, to pin a number to the market and to qualify it and quantify it. To do that, you need the money. You need to build a machine and start selling it and, and get input from customers. So it's like a, a catch-22 situation. You need the money to get the money. Um, to get around that, what we came up with was to, to do an MVP. That the main aim uh, of the MVP is to test the market. And the way that we're doing it, that we have been doing it, is that we interact with companies. We get orders for parts. We manufacture the parts at, on our prototype. Um, even though at the end, we want to build the final machine to sell them the machine itself. Just put on the slides that when, when we invested initially, the, the one machine on the left was uh, like this crazy rig was, was built by John and Eyal, his partner, and was able to manufacture the first parts. It was really, really impressive. But the difficulty was really that we didn't know who would buy the machine, what would they do with it. And, and uh, to be completely transparent, when you invest in pre-seed, early seed companies, um, I think it's even more so in Israel, um, the ability to take on the marketing risk or the market risk, because we know the team, amazing people, everyone who's met them, and we validated it with a lot of other VCs that looked at them. Um, amazing team, amazing idea, amazing and unique technology, as John mentioned, not a lot of people have the PhD in electro-optics to be able to even think about such ideas. It's not an app or, God forbid, a cyber startup. Um, we, we decided that uh, the, the most important thing to do in the beginning is to see how they solve this catch-22. And uh, when they came back to us with a, with a solution, with the idea to serve as a service bureau, um, we decided to, uh, to go in and invest. Um, and since then, we're um, extremely happy to see the process. And maybe you want to say a couple of words about the process, the collaboration with our partners, and how you got from a point where you had a, this brig to the left to a point where you're actually quite close to product market fit now in about one year. Yeah, so the way that we have been working is really interacting with customers. I think till about a month ago, we, we worked with about 100 companies to understand their problem, you know, talking to them, talking to the engineers, making parts for them, solving their problems. Um, currently, we have five ongoing POCs with large companies. Um, some of these companies came through the work, through, who are in, actually runs investors like GE and Tata. So it's a lot of work finding who you're going to work with within G and Tata, of course. And they have people that are in charge of that that help us find these POCs. Um, yeah, I think that's. And also maybe worth mentioning is that you were in stealth mode until about a month ago, is it? And then came out with a press release after have refining the product and the vision in terms of the value proposition. And came out with a press release and got back a lot of interest for many, many new clients. Yeah, so from, uh, I think, in, within the last month, we got at least uh, 100 good leads, mails, incoming mails, asking about the printer, asking about the product, price, materials, specs. Every day now, me and the business development uh, person in our, in our team have maybe five, five calls with customers daily. So from a situation when we had to go out and start finding who needs this, what, what's it good for, we're now doing uh, inside sales. Uh, which is much more efficient, of course. Can you give maybe an example of an interaction with a client that came to you? I don't know whether it would be um, uh, one of the use cases or one of the companies came to you with uh, a request, maybe to print a part, what you did with that request and how it got to the point where you decided that it would be one of our potential killer apps. Yeah. So, so we've sort of built, uh, and actually we did this uh, together in the process, we've sort of built a, a process of how to how to uh, qualify a killer app. So we get all the incoming leads. From then, we decide the ones that seem interesting. And then we spend like maybe uh, six hours work on, on like qualifying if it's really interesting or not, if it's worth doing a POC of this killer app. A killer app is something with a big enough market. We, have a, we are solving a big enough pain. Um, and we can get into the market fast enough. 
If we do, then we go ahead and we work with the company in this killer app on a POC that can take maybe months to, to really prove the, the value that we have in that. OK, cool. So what's the next step? What's the next big milestone that you envision for Nanofabrica? Um, well, the next immediate step in about a year is Series A. We're going to be raising our uh, Series A. Before that, we've already, uh, we're going to be delivering the first product. We've closed a deal of over a million dollars with the first uh, customer. So we're going to be delivering the first product, raising Series A. Um, yeah, I guess as a startup, you always have the immediate milestone and the final sort of direction that you're going. So, so I don't know if that was the direction of the question, but the final direction is to you know, be a publicly traded company leading micro and nano manufacturing, you know, moving the, these industries into digital, the digital era. Cool. Um, maybe we have three more minutes. Instead of me asking you the last question that I had in mind, is there anyone here that has a, a question that you'd like to ask? John about early stage hardware related companies or uh, or me about i3 and our partners no questions okay so John when you think about nanofabrica's team um, the hiring the ability to uh, uh, to get the best people and keep them What's your number one motto in terms of uh, being able to build the strongest, most capable, loyal team? So first of all, there's something I don't know how many people in the audience know, that Israel is a real valley of printing. Like their uh, Stratasys, the biggest 3D printing company in the world, or one of the biggest 3D, print, biggest 3D printing companies in the world is here, XJet, lots of good uh, printing companies. They all, the people came from Indigo and Landa. Uh, so there's lots of talent uh, that's going around that we harness. Um, right now, we've got a, a, a mean, lean group. Everyone's really dedicated, really working on the, on the, on the go. So one of the things that uh, John uh, forgot to mention is that in, in him, him and Ayal think about uh, team transparency and collaboration as the number one value in the company. Recently, I think it was last week, they tore down the last wall, the last remaining wall in their office space because they want, at least at this very early stage, every engineer to hear every conversation with a potential client so that the product evolves that the, uh, uh, in a way that's completely uh, aligned with customer requirements, even things that um, maybe could get lost in translation. So at least at this very, very early stage, it will probably change um, after the Series A. Um, the company really values intercompany communication, transparency. Everybody knows everything there is to know uh, from the technical aspects to the funding aspects to, uh, uh, to the marketing, uh, to the marketing uh, strategies. And that, I think, is uh, admirable and unique. Um, and I think that, uh, that really, really helps in the early stages uh, of a company to create a lean and mean team. Um, so if there's no questions from, oh, there's one question over there, far away. Yeah, go ahead. We have 50, 49 seconds. Yeah. Um, well, usually now uh, the companies already have the files that they're making on other technologies. Um, if they're starting from scratch and they want to order it, it can take months, maybe three to six months. We get it. We print it within hours. You know, the first iteration is after a few hours. The second iteration, three iterations in the first day. So when when you um, when you think of uh, 3D printing speed and the ability to customize, and the ability to respond quickly, and have lower um, stocks, time's up, is really the value of, uh, of additive manufacturing over other traditional, more traditional uh, manufacturing uh, techniques. Um, so thank you very much for staying this late and listening to us. We appreciate your time.
And of course, again, another round of applause for Marco for organizing this awesome event. Thank you.